You ever realize a moment too late that you've just said something hurtful or unwise or untrue just just as they're coming out of your mouth? Uh, sometimes that can be funny. The, the comedian Brian Regan tells a story about walking up to a group of people talking at a party and realizing that they were talking about art. And so even though he didn't particularly care much or know much about art, wanted to be a part of the conversation. And so, and so offered right away, I love art. And then, just, and then he mimed, trying to grab the words and shove them back into his mouth because he realized that he was going to commit himself to be a part of the conversation, to have to have something intelligible to offer. So he was asked what museums he'd been to and said he couldn't think of a single museum name even though he had just released I Love Art like a flock of doves into the conversation. He was asked, what's your favorite Cezanne? And he replied, Winter. And it went on like that. It was very, it was very funny. It was so relatable because we have all had the experience of saying something without thinking first. Sometimes it's funny. Other times it's hurtful. You know how it can happen when someone is saying something that you don't like or someone's confronting you with some fault or bad habit of yours and your, your reflex reaction is to lash out at them. You find something to put them down with or to criticize them for so that you can sort of cancel out the thing that they're saying. You make it so you don't have to listen. At least that's how we justify it to ourselves. And maybe it's something that's that's particularly hurtful, that you wouldn't say under normal circumstances, but it's a, it's a reflex, and you don't think, and then it's just, it's out there, and you can't unsay it. Our tongues are powerful things. They can be funny. They can speak profound truths. They can lie. They can encourage. They can praise. They can pray. Or they can hurt, they can defame, they can curse. So with our tongues, we have these two truths, both accurate at the same time. They're really easy to use. And they are very powerful. Easy to use, very powerful. Because they're easy to use, they're easy to misuse as well. Because both of these things are true, James has something important to say about our tongues. That's our passage for this morning. It's in James chapter 3. We're going to read James chapter 3 and the first 12 verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member. Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we want to praise you, bless you with our tongues. And yet we know that they also get us into an awful lot of trouble. So we pray, help us to think about the words that we say, the importance of our tongues, that our words matter, and let all of that point us to you. Let the way we use our tongues be directed towards you, be used to serve you, obey you, love you, and through that, to love others. So Jesus, speak your truth to us from your word. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So there's some trouble with our tongues. That much is clear. We're going to start there. The trouble with the tongue. The trouble with the tongue. And the first problem is that it's a small thing that makes big problems. Look again at the first six verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, but it boasts of great things. How great a force to set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. James starts by emphasizing how important the things we say are. There's that verse at the beginning about how not many should be teachers. And I think he has in mind primarily teachers in the church. It seems like it's, it's disconnected from everything that follows, but, but it's, actually, it's actually very closely connected. J- James's point is that teachers will be judged with greater strictness precisely because, one, we do a lot of talking, and two, the words that we say don't only affect us and the people directly around us, but everyone who listens. To claim to expound and apply the Word of God is a great responsibility, and it it has the potential to affect the faith and the life of those who listen, either positively or negatively. So to teach in a way that makes those who listen grow in arrogance, grow in self-righteousness, or grow in lawlessness rather than in faith, hope, and love makes the teacher liable not only for his own words, but for the effect that they have on other people. It's a big deal. Because teachers teach and preach and pray and explain, our our words are important. They matter. And speaking has this unique ability to, to get ourselves in trouble. James says the tongue is small, yet it boasts of great things. It's like a rudder on a ship, which is small compared to the whole, yet it guides the ship where it will go. It's like the small bits that are put into the mouths of a horse, which aren't all that big compared to a big, powerful horse, and yet, and yet they tell the horse which way it's supposed to go. A forest fire can start with just a spark. And James says our, our tongue is our own personal matchbox. Even with its small size, it's, it's very hard to control. In verse 3, James says that if anyone doesn't stumble in what they say, then they're perfect. Everything else is under control too. Now, how, how can that be? The implication, what he's saying is that, is that the tongue is the hardest thing in the whole body to control. More difficult than our appetite for food, more difficult than our, our sexual desire, more difficult than disciplining ourselves in exercise and other positive habits. He says if you can get your tongue under control, then everything else is easy because it is the most difficult, the hardest to control. It's notoriously difficult because it's so easy to use. How many friendships have been harmed by things said in a, in a moment of anger? By confidences broken where, where secrets were let slip? How many family thanksgivings have been ruined by someone speaking rashly after one too many beers or glasses of wine? 
How often are we stringent about the things that other people do or do not do, but we're lax and thoughtless in our own words? The tongue is a small thing, but it causes big trouble. Tongue is also trouble because too often we have too small a view of what watching our tongue means. Look again at verses 9 and 10. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing my brothers. These things ought not to be so. For pretty much my whole life growing up, what I learned about taming the tongue, if not explicitly, at least in the way that other people kind of talked about it, was that it had primarily to do with not taking the Lord's name in vain and not saying rude or bad words, right? So if you don't say OMG and don't use the choicest four-letter words, you basically have taming your tongue covered. I think that's the way it's sort of been looked at for a lot of folks for a while now. But that's a very small idea about what taming our tongues is supposed to mean. Those are important things. Not taking the Lord's name in vain does mean not using words about him flippantly. That's, that's true. And the New Testament in other places does warn us against things like filthy speech or coarse joking, but our tongues can do much greater damage than that. Think about the pressure that social media puts on us to have a hard opinion about absolutely everything. Because it makes it so easy for us to say or type things that so many people can hear us with just one click of a button. We come to believe it's, it's our duty to speak authoritatively on everything. There's no careful listening, no trusting the expertise of others. There's only me and my soapbox. The world needs to hear my voice. And so we're encouraged yet again as, as if our tongues weren't already primed for it to speak without thinking. It's encouraged. That's not to say there's nothing good about social media. It can be used very well. That's not to say there is never a time to speak publicly about important matters. Those times do come. But we shouldn't let those truths convince us that every thought we think is worth speaking immediately and that silence is always foolish or cowardly or complicit. Sometimes it's wise. More than that, James sees blessing God and cursing men out of the same mouth coming from the same tongue as an expression of the sinfulness of our tongues and that one always stops me in my tracks. Have you ever known a person who is, is positively horrified anytime they hear someone used, uh, use a word considered crass or rude? Someone who, if they hear someone else use a word like that, their opinion of that person will be forever lowered because of it. But that same person would happily spill every dirty secret about everyone they've ever met, would talk casually about this person's drinking problem or that person's adultery or the other person's difficult home life. Bless God in one moment, recoil in horror at a bad word in the next, and then talk trash about Bob and Jill so-and-so down the street. James says this should not be so. The harm done by gossip is hard to overstate. And yet we feel perfectly comfortable recounting the sins of other people to people who have no business knowing about it or talking about it, discussing it with. I, I know I've said it before, and I also know I've broken this rule myself, but a good gauge for gossip is asking ourselves the question, would I say this thing I'm about to say if the person I'm talking about were standing here in the conversation? We like to minimize our definition of gossip down to truth-telling. If the thing I'm saying is true, it doesn't matter who I say it to. But it does matter. It's a matter, actually, of, of keeping the ninth commandment against bearing false witness and in favor of truthfulness and charity in speech. The Westminster Larger Catechism, one of the... One of the 
public confessions that we have as Presbyterians, one of the sort of public documents, our declarations of what we believe. Uh, the larger catechism is a, is a document, if you've never read it at all, that's fine, but it's a, it's a series of questions and answers about the faith. It's meant to teach us in sort of a relatable way like that. You ask a question and then you get the answer. Question and answer 144 talks about the ninth commandment against bearing false witness against our neighbor. It says one of the things that it requires of us is preserving and promoting the good name of our neighbor. And the next question, 145, says that one of the sins of the ninth commandment is prejudicing the good name of our neighbor. That means that truthfulness and charity requires of us that we try to preserve a good reputation for other people. We don't go sharing every wrong they've ever done to us just because we can we do say positive or uplifting things about them. That's, that's completely in line with James here. Bless God and curse men made in the image of God, both with the same tongue, this they should not be. So we have this problem with our tongues. They're small, they're easy to use, but they're powerful and they're hard to control. They have the ability to do a lot of damage. So is there any good news? Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the hope for our tongues. Everything we've just said is true, and we know it's true because we've all lived it to one, to one degree or another. We've all hurt people with our tongues, and we've all been hurt by the things that other people have said. So what hope is there for us? Well, first, we should think about what our tongues are actually for. We have this incredible gift of speech, that God's given to us as men and women made in His image. Other creatures can communicate too, but language as complex as ours is, is unique in all of creation. It's a part of our bearing the image of the God who spoke the universe into existence, of bearing the image of Jesus who always has been the Word of God. We have a problem with our tongues, but the answer isn't to become silent. It isn't to stop using them. It isn't to stop speaking. It's to learn what they're for. It's to learn what we're supposed to say. What sorts of things are profitable and God-honoring to say that are good for us, good for others. Ephesians 5 verse 4 says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Paul takes the way we often speak, which is self-focused and can be crude and all the rest of it, and, and he redirects it towards the Lord. He says, give him thanks with your tongue instead. Use your tongues to, to sing praises to God, to thank him for what he gives, to pray. But like he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In that same portion of 1 Thessalonians, Paul says quite a bit about the things we say. He tells us to admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with all. To speak the truth to each other for the sake of our good. If someone's lazy, remind them of their potential and their abilities and their responsibilities. If someone is scared, remind them of God's powerful goodness. And he also says, encourage one another and build one another up. James has been chastising us for our... For, for using our tongues to tear down, to, to hurt others, to harm, to lie. But we really ought to encourage each other. I used to be impervious to encouragement. I used to, I used to block it out. I'd listen to criticism, but, but encouragement I just, I just set aside. I thought it was the entryway for pride. But in time, I've come to realize that we all need it. I've seen people be corrected for telling someone else you can do it, or you've got this. Why? If you're encouraging a person in something good and worthwhile, taking on a new challenge, committing themselves to a new, healthier routine, giving birth to the first time, resolving to leave an old sin behind and press on a new obedience, if that's what you're encouraging someone towards, then encouraging them is exactly what your tongue is for. Which I think is why it's so harmful when we're constantly criticizing others, nitpicking things to be upset about. It runs against the purpose of our tongues. 
Loving criticism for the sake of needed correction is good, but making being critical a habit in our speech isn't. Complaining all the time isn't. Because we're all lousy when it comes to controlling our tongues. And if we think we're great at it, we're not paying attention. James says if you control your tongue and don't stumble in what you say, then you must be perfect because the tongue is just about the hardest thing to control. And since none of us are perfect, often quite the opposite, there's room for all of us to grow in, in dousing the blazing fire of our tongues. But James almost seems down on the possibility of that happening. Almost. He says we can tame beasts of the earth, but we can't tame the tongue in verses 7 and 8. And it would be easy to read that and take away that we're all doomed to curse and gossip and say the stupidest things for the rest of our lives. And it's true that none of us will gain perfect control over our tongues in this life. But we'd be wrong to despair. Our passage in, in verse 8, the very beginning of verse 8, says, but no human being can tame the tongue. That's a good translation. It's, it's basically what James is saying. But a very literal reading of verse 8 would say something like, no one among men is able to tame the tongue. That might just be a way of speaking that means something like no one can tame the tongue, but it's probably meant to get us to ask the question, so is there someone who's not a mere man who can tame the tongue? It's meant to take our first hope for a tame tongue out of our hands. It's meant to take our hope for the way that we treat each other by the things that we say first out of our hands. On this point, the, the ancient church father, St. Augustine, said this. He doesn't say that no one can tame the tongue, but no one of men. So that when it is tamed, we confess that this is brought about by the pity, the help of the grace of God. If Augustine is right, and I think he is, then what James is saying is that our only hope to have forgiveness for our wildfire tongues and our only hope to see growth and maturing in the way that we speak is to trust God's grace. Part of the problem is that we don't really want to stop treating every thought that passes through our heads as if it's so important that everyone needs to hear it immediately. So we just speak without thinking. We don't really want to stop sharing all the sinful truths about others because it's a lot less fun to preserve our neighbor's good names. So we don't ask God to help us. Or we convince ourselves that if we don't say OMG or don't use particular four-letter words that we're sufficiently holy in our speech. The truth is that we need the forgiveness and the help of the one who was silent like a lamb before his shearers. We need the help of the one who would call Pharisees to repentance, who could offer comfort by speaking healing, and who could hold his tongue when he was ready to bear our sins. He forgives. He will help. If you're recognizing you have a fiery tongue, Go to the one who held his so that he could offer himself as a sacrifice for you. He'll forgive you. And if you want to learn more self-control with your tongue, pay attention to the people that you know who speak rarely but who are always worth listening to when they open their mouths. If you want to learn to be more encouraging and less critical, meditate every day on the truth that your heavenly Father has spoken his love for you in Jesus Christ. And pray for help, for a joyful, gracious, loving spirit that will overflow in the way that you speak. With the Spirit's help and guidance, you can do it. Let's pray. Father, we know we've hurt other people with the things that we've said. We know we've said foolish things, unwise things, hurtful things. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Thank you that he came to speak only the truth, to speak only with love, to hold his tongue when the time came. 
so that he could go to the cross and bear the sins of people like us, that he could take fiery tongues and make them holy. He could take sinful people and make us his. Thank you. We want to be encouragers. We want to be positive in the way that we speak. We want to guard each other's reputations and those around us. Fill us with the joy, the love, the peace, and the patience that it takes to do this well and remind us that all of those things are already ours through Jesus Christ. Help us to glorify you and encourage those made in your image for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.